Excellent. Thank you. And um, is Bradley on? I see Bradley has a Bradley Soyan. Soyan, is he from the? Uh, I'm here. Congress I'm in the office? DCF as I'm legislative director for Congress. There you go. And I've seen you before too. <laughs> Thank you. And Felicia, right. do you want to say hello quickly? Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, Felicia Goldstein. I'm her district chief of staff and a big fan of the downtown Delray. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kristen, you're next. Hi. Um, Kristen Rose, um, Kristen Rose Agency, PR agency located in Delray Beach. Um, I met, the, I had the pleasure of meeting the Congresswoman at Sam Bauer's house like in wow. West Palm Beach probably yeah. three years ago. So I don't know if you remember me, but hi again. Yeah, hi. Hello, good to see you again. Thank you for doing this for us. I'm also a part of the executive board for Delray Beach Wonderful. Chamber. So happy to support Stephanie and everything that the chamber does. Thank you, Kristen. I'm Jackie Ramirez from the SPDC. Oh, hello, yeah, I'm Jackie Ramirez. I'm with the SPDC and it's a pleasure, Representative Franco, to meet you live as well as Felicia, who I spoke with some time ago. So um, welcome to Delray. Thank you. How about Johnny Mackey? Do you want to say hello? Oh, he's there. <laughs> of course I want to say hello. I'm Johnny Mackey. Thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to us. I, uh, I am the owner of Shamrock Restoration. We do uh, uh, water damage, mold, and uh, fire. So we've been out and about through this whole thing. Thank you. Um, Michael Weiner, how about you? I see you there. Michael Weiner, Saxax Kaplan. Uh, welcome, Representative Frankel. Um, you've, you've had a great legacy for us in Palm Beach County. Honestly, we can't, can't thank you enough. Um, West Palm Beach is, is just looking spectacular. Um, <laughs> leave that in good, in good graces, so thank you. Thank you. And how about Joy from Jam Lexus? Hi, how are you, everybody? Um, well, she introduced me. I'm Joy from Jam Lexus. Um, I'm our senior uh, marketing specialist here at the dealership. Um, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman, for being here. Um, we are excited to be a member of this amazing community. I'm longtime members of the Delray Chamber. I'm excited to continue that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen? Gee. Hi, Karen G. Hi, I'm with American Cleaning Services. Um, we've been servicing the hospitality industry for 40 years. We are a national company and we do have products that combat COVID-19 um, aside from regular cleaning protocols. So, hi everyone. Thank you. And uh, Nancy? Curtin? Unmute. There you Hi, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Curtin. I'm a certified financial planner and wealth manager. And I just, uh, my husband and I moved here in January. And we immediately joined the chamber and uh, really looking forward to being able to get back in and meet up with more people and really connect. Uh, trying to do the best we can on Zoom and it's been going pretty good. So I'll look forward to seeing all of you in person whenever it's safe to do so. Thank you. And I appreciate being on this call. Thank you. So Noreen Payne, my board chair. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Noreen Payne, I have a real estate team here in the Delray Beach area, all about Florida homes. Thank you, Representative uh, Frankel, for being with us today. So appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. Um, Shannon Eden from Old School Square, are you there? Shannon, I know you're there. <laughs> Not Maybe just to unmute. Okay. <laughs> okay, how about Jeff Dash? I know you're there. Is this my shy yes, crowd? Um, Jeff Dash. Ash Travel, a 62-year-old family travel business that's going through some rough times. Mm. But uh, we have a beautiful cruise ship golf cart cruising around Delray Beach. And I have a new business, which is Delray Beach Experience, which is an app that's a digital guide supporting local businesses and nonprofits. Good. Thank you. And I see Barbara Cambia from Lynn University. Do you want to say hello quickly? Barbara. <laughs> All right, Kathy Balistrieri. 
Hey, hi everybody. Um, this is Kathy Balistri. I'm the general manager at Cranes Beach House um, in Delray Beach, Florida. And I am proud to say that we're um, about ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary in Delray. And also that my team stayed open all through COVID and we've managed to um, really do a great job keeping everyone safe. So I wanna also thank um, Representative Lois Frankel for your help and I know that um, all of the information on the PPP loan really helped us tremendously. So I want to thank you. I, I was on that call with you and I'm um, just happy to be here today. Thank you. And Bill Branning, I see you just joined us. Do you want to say something, Bill? <laughs> Bill from BSA Construction, my former board chair. Okay, and I see Jim Chard. Do you want to say hello quickly, Jim? You know. Good morning, and I'd like to give Frankel. a special thanks to Congressman Frankel, who, uh, in a difficult time in my life, uh, after I just lost uh, an election, came up to me and said, "You'll win the next time." I, I went through this too. <laughs> so cute. And uh, last but not least, we've got um, Ellen Smith from Waste Management, who's going to say a few words in a little while after we um, speak with Representative Frankel. But do you want to say hello quickly, Ellen? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Congresswoman Frankel. Politics is a blood sport now more than ever, and we are grateful for your leadership <laughs> on behalf of Waste Management. Thank you. That's great. So just quickly, um, now, now that we're all zoomed in, we're going to, she's limited time, so we're just going to have Representative Frankel just give us an overview of what's going on in Washington with respect to federal legislation, what's going down with the pandemic response, update on the peaceful protests. And then we're able to do a Q&A if you'd like to um, via the Zoom functions, the Q&A Zoom functions. Um, and then Ellen will give us a quick update and then I can tell you later about the Chamber business um, business update, what's going on. Um, Representative Frank will probably have to Zoom off by then, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you, Representative Frankel. And thanks, Stephanie, and thank you. So good to be with all of you. Uh, obviously, we're in a very stressful, challenging time here. Uh, the COVID pandemic has turned so many lives upside down. And the, the, the killing of George Floyd has created a moment of national anguish and a renewed awareness of racial injustice. And, uh, those are the two, those issues of what uh, Congress really we have been focused on uh, for the last months. And so I'm going to give you an overview of that. The uh, pandemic, we've lost 110,000 lives in this country. We're at the highest unemployment since the Great, the great Depression. And, you know, I, do, I just talked to so many people who were so sad. They're sad because they, they're not having the social interaction, uh, separated from their family and friends, some with health issues, and so many business owners who, who worked 20 years, 40 years to build up vibrant businesses and just like in a flash <coughs> to see them destroyed through no fault of their own, just over and over, I keep hearing that story, millions of people unemployed, hundreds of thousands here in Florida, and that's, the topper, of course, in Florida is we've had a, a broken unemployment system. So uh, let me give a quick overview of some of the things that, that Congress have, has, have, that we've done to try to address some of these issues. First thing we passed what's called the CARES Act. It was a good bipartisan bill, I'm happy to say. The emphasis of that bill was on testing, testing, testing. It's about putting the virus in a box. There's no vaccine, there's no cure. How do we uh, get ourselves in a situation so we can reopen to maybe not go back to exactly how it was before, but to try to reopen our lives, to have more social contact, to be able to get more people back into the workforce. Uh, uh, and what we, so the emphasis really has to be on uh, making sure when people are tested uh, that there's what's called contact tracing so that anyone they've exposed is contacted. And then people who are infected are put or go voluntarily go into isolation. That is the way we're going to get the hand.
handle on that. I, mean, I, I, I want to repeat that because, you know, I know you, you probably watch press camp conferences where there's so many numbers thrown out at you. Uh, well, what's important is if we have a very, very good testing, contact tracing, and then isolation uh, regime, uh, supportive isolation for people who can't do that in their own home. That's how we're gonna, that's how we're going to get this virus in a box. The uh, we also took a look at financial assistance. Obviously, uh, greatest unemployment since uh, the Great Depression. Thousands, millions out of work. We uh, put money into direct payments to go to most people' bank bank accounts. We uh, added to unemployment assistance. Uh, uh, Florida, unfortunately had the worst, one of the worst in the country in, in, uh, in our benefits, $275 a week maximum, which is not even minimum wage. Keeping in mind that the average employment in this, in this state was about $1,000 a week. So $275 doesn't cut it. Congress added $600 a week for 16 weeks. So that is helping most if they can get it. I want to point out something that I think is very important for business owners and for you to uh, get the word around, Stephanie, if you haven't. Uh, you can put pe people on reduced hours and they also are eligible to get unemployment assistance if, it's a little complicated, if they are earning less than $333 a week. There's a formula that gets us to there. And so those of you who want, who are reducing your employees hours, keep in mind that if you follow the formula and they're earning less than $333 a week, they can get the $600 a week relief from the federal government. This is a very good tool for you to keep your folks employed if you're special, if you're not on, you don't have the PPP, is to get them to go to the Florida uh, unemployment, uh, it's called the reemployment web, web page. That's a, there's also another uh, way to do this that I think most businesses are probably not aware of. But Florida has what's called the short time compensation program, which allows a business uh, to enter into an agreement with the state where you agree to continue your employees' health benefits. And then the state now the federal government will pay their wages or, or, or part of their wages if their hours are reduced. So make sure, take a look at that and see if you can get some more information for your folks because that's another very good tool. Uh, we also establish what's called the, the uh, payroll protection program, uh, uh, which probably some of your members are now participating. We just passed a a bill that's signed into law that will give some more flexibility in that. Now you can have 24 weeks up until December 31st to use your money. And there's some flexibility on how you can use that money. We put money into a program called EIDL, e -D -E -I -D -L, which would allow business owners to get immediately a $10,000 cash assistance that doesn't have to be paid back. So uh, that's some of the financial assistance that we've, that we've actually passed on a bipartisan basis, I'm happy to say. I, I want to uh, suggest, respectfully suggest, that you lobby Governor DeSantis on, on fixing this uh, unemployment, the reduced hours compensation. Uh, and we'll, Stephanie, we're going to send you a letter, a copy of a letter that I, that we're sending to the governor on this, because as I said, this will be a very good tool if you must reduce your employees' the hours for them to get compensation, be able to live and still at least work partial, partial time. Now, big problem for state and local governments, excuse me. Um, State and local governments not getting the taxes, not getting the fees they need. Budgets are shrinking. They are about to go into big layoff mode. Uh, 
who is this going to affect? Uh, uh, state budget teachers, uh, local, not only your first responders, people pick up the garbage, people who really affect our daily quality of life. We are in a great threat of those people being unemployed. Uh, that's why uh, the House uh, recently passed what we call the HEROES Act, where we uh, uh, try to send money back to state and local governments to fill those budgets. That bill also, something that I know you all are interested in, uh, it, uh, allows the uh, PPP uh, to go to all 501c nonprofits. And uh, that bill also, uh, what do we do? More money for testing, money for absentee, uh, abs uh, what we call stay at home balloting or vote by mail. We fund the post office, which is also going to run out of money in, in this fall. And we add more financial relief, extending unemployment, more direct uh, money to people, uh, subsidizing people who have to go on COBRA because they've lost their job, uh, subsidizing people with their mortgage and their rent payments, adding more to food assistance. A lot of financial assistance to keep people afloat until we can get back where we need to be. And that bill is sitting in the Senate. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, truthfully, I don't know what the Senate's going to do, but I'm going to tell you this. My phone is still ringing off the hooks in our office every single day from people who are in terrible distress. So it's, to me, we have to act. Now, let me talk to, uh, just next to something that I know has just shocking anyone who saw the, the murder of George Floyd. I'm sure we were all shocked and heartbroken. Uh, and really, this is a time for real reflection in all levels of society, all levels of society, not just the police. But we've been somewhat, I think, fortunate in Palm Beach County in that our police don't use some of the, the brutal techniques that the uh, we saw in Minnesota, but make no mistake, uh, there is there's a, a culture in the Justice Department that has to be reformed all over the country. So let me tell you uh, what we did, uh, what we're doing, what we're working on. In fact, today as we speak, there is a committee meeting going on. Uh, just uh, the uh, Justice Committee, Judiciary committee is hearing uh, testimony on what we call the Justice and Policing Act, which we just unveiled. Let me tell you what it does quickly. Uh, it removes barriers to prosecuting police misconduct and recovering damages from officers who have viol violated civilian rights. It demilitizes the police force, limiting the transfer of military weapon to, to state and local departments. It Bats, uh, police brutality, including uh, by, by requiring body and dashboard cameras, banning choke calls, ending the use of no-knock warrants in drug cases, and enacting steps to end, to end racial profiling. It steps up pressure on the Justice Department to address systemic racial discrimination by law enforcement. And uh, believe it or not, it, it makes lynching a federal hate crime. Guess what? I can't believe it hasn't been in the past. So this is a really monumental, a monumental bill. Uh, I do want to uh, say, I, I, know, I know I've heard some people say we should defund police. No, 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 I want, let me just to make it clear that defunding police is not the answer. Uh, what we need to do is reform policies and then take a look at budgets us to take money, not from, necessarily not from the police departments, but we, we definitely do need to put resources towards some of the root causes that are causing our, our social injustice. And, you know, taking a look at uh, housing and healthcare and mental health, education, resources and small business. Those are the kinds of things that we should start to put more resources in. Uh, but in terms of the police, it, it's, the word should be reform, not 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 defund. So, 
that's where we are. Uh, my understanding is that the Senate also may be looking at a at a plan, and I hope that you know we can come together and do something meaningful for Americans. And you know, I, let me just uh, before I take your questions, you know, through all this, I mean, the horrificness of the times, and let's hey, we are really in challenging times, right? To me, the hope has been these young people who have been protesting mostly peacefully you know i don't count i don't count uh vandals and, and scandals and all those people i don't count them as peaceful protesters those people are are diverting a very important message or they're very counterproductive but our young people who who are who have taken to the streets in a peaceful way showing what's in their hearts and their minds and sending a message to all us adults that they're not going to go back that they want uh they want justice and equality uh, at all levels of our society i think that's been really a great thing i do hope wish they were more of them were wearing masks and socially distanced but with that said i do think our, our youth gives us great hope so with that, Stephanie, I'm going to yield back to you all, take some of your questions. I have a few minutes before I have to get on another Zoom, but anything I can answer, I'll be happy to. Or, and, and what I can do, Stephanie, is I can leave my, my staff on to answer questions that, I have, that I'm not here to answer. OK. Oh, thank you so much, Representative Frankel. Um, I know a few of you sent questions in. She answered most of them, the ones that I, I saw. But um, go ahead if you want to either um, just ask her right now or type in um, a question in the chat. That would be great. There's some comments in the chat that I'm noticing. Um, Kathy Ballas Jerry is like, that's great info, that information on the, the aspect of the short term, short time compensation program. I didn't know about that. So we'll definitely promote that to our members. And Barbara Cambia from Lynn says, she's so happy that you're here. She loves you. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you too. I'm gonna make sure my alarm doesn't keep going off on me. I have so many zooms. Okay, we're good. All right. Well, so yeah, may I just em emphasize uh, this un underemployment or the the short time employment. Please, uh, this is an action for all the chambers across this state. Is to inform yourself and then put some pressure on the government to straighten it out. We're talking about federal money, not one penny has to come from the state of Florida. We're talking about federal money that you can, your employees can uh, uh, use to allow them to le lead a decent life and still work part time for you. So please make sure you follow up on that. And we'll help you with that too. Well, we have um, a te one technical question for you. Um, yeah. It's from Johnny Mackey. Um, the unemployment system in Florida, as you know, and I've heard you speak several times before how broken it is. And the last time um, she looked at her unemployment payout, there's a max payout of 3,300. Is, is that, is there any way to increase, is that the right number or are there ways to increase it or we don't know? I have never heard that. I will tell you that, that, that cannot be correct. Uh, because if, if I, if even the federal benefit, $600 a week times 16, I know that's more than $3,300. I have to do that, I can't do that math in my head, but uh, I don't know if anyone, Felicia, anybody uh, from my staff, have you, is that any? Congresswoman, this is Josh Cohen. Yeah. Uh, the the 3,300 limit is for the state benefits, not for- Oh, okay. Employment. okay. So the state can only provide up to 3,300 and that's a Governor DeSantis issue. The $6 okay. federal benefit is not included. Okay, so that's that answer. I, you know what? I Thank you for raising that. There goes another letter to the governor. That is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> that's, that's the max. I mean, people are out of work for no fault of their own. And uh, okay, so thank you for raising that. Let's, Let's, Josh and Felicia, we need to uh, need to take a look at that real quick. Mm. That's in great. The meantime, that in the meantime, I do think, though, they, they do, there is a requirement that you go on every two weeks, uh, right? Is that correct, Felicia? You have to go on every two weeks to get your unemployment. So make 
sure you tell your wife to do that, yes. Johnny. You have to show, claim your weeks. So, um, Jim Char, not to put you on the spot, but you had a couple of questions, and there was one question that you had that I don't think we answered. If I can remember, do you, did you remember which one? <clears throat> um, the uh, issue of uh, police militarization, the congressman <laughs> touched on it briefly. This is the 1033 program. Mm -hmm. Basically, ships military grade hardware tanks right. to and it's very appealing to police departments because it's free. Um, but I, I would go just beyond that a little bit. The mayor of Houston made a very uh, significant promise on all of the changes that that city was going to do, the, to ban chokeholds, uh, to do a whole series of things that really do end up with militarization of police. It's not just a hardware issue. Right. Well, we have tremendous reform in our legislation, but what I would, uh, what I strongly recommend to all our local leaders is this. The reform has to, obviously has to come in, at the state and local levels, and it really is our local, uh, uh, the county commission and the city councils and the mayors that really uh, control your our police forces so regardless of whether or not our legislation passes there needs to be an insistence by uh, the public and really especially coming from our business leaders that every one of our uh, police forces and uh, takes a look and reviews their policies i mean i think we're going to find that palm beach county is in a uh, uh, probably a better situation than a lot of these police departments around the country, but we need to take a good hard look at the hiring practices, the discipline practices. I, I will tell you, I, I was mayor for eight years and there was nothing more difficult than firing a cop who had, who had been involved in very bad misconduct. I mean, I, just to give you one uh, quick example, I had a we had a police officer who we had a video with somebody handcuffed and that police officer bashing that the person's head in and our police chief fired him and then a uh, uh, arbitrator made us hire him back. Uh, of course, what we did is she put him on desk duty for the rest of his career, but it's very, very difficult. The unions have been very, very strong uh, but I do, I do think this, I believe that public outcry is even stronger now and we need to pay attention. With that, Stephanie, I need to hop off. If anyone has more questions, uh, we can keep Josh and Brad and Felicia on board. Uh, but thank you so much. It's been a lot. I'm great to see you all. Invite me back. We can have more conversation. I will. I'm going to take you up on that. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us today. Good, good to be with you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Well. Socially distance. Remember, masks. Wash your hands. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. So did um, anybody else have any questions for um, Representative Frankel's um, staff? They're super knowledgeable. They're here if you had any other um, detailed questions that, that you wanted to put to them. Stephanie, this is Josh Cohen. I'll, I'll just add one uh, item to that question about unemployment that, that might be relevant. I think it was Johnny who was asking the question. The $3,300 cap is for state benefits, and you get that number just by calculating 12 weeks of the maximum $276 a week. And the Congresswoman has sent numerous letters to Governor DeSantis urging him to raise both the number of weeks that you can get benefits and the amount of the benefits per week. So other states with similar costs of living typically pay out around $500 a week in unemployment benefits. Florida is almost the worst in the country. And so that's something she's been focused on and that would automatically raise the cap. So uh, we're, the Congresswoman is uh, talking about this to us every day. And so she'll continue reaching out to the governor and the state about this issue. Thank you. And um, she's still eligible for the federal bump, though, at least for eight weeks now? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah.
Great. Stephanie, could I ask a question? Of course. Um, one of the things that the woman didn't touch on, I'd like to hear uh, from Felicia or Josh, the uh, vote by mail issue, mm. which uh, is, of course, tied in with uh, all that's going on, the pandemic, the uh, uh, right. racial issues. Uh, and we just saw in Georgia yesterday a complete uh, bollocksing of the voting system and people standing in line for five and six hours in order to vote machines uh, not available and uh, the worst problems in uh, African-American communities. Is there uh, something that uh, the Congresswoman is doing or something that Congress can do to ensure that vote by mail and funding of vote by mail is going to happen uh, in this very uh, important election year? Yes, well, that's a good question, Jim, and it's an important question question. As you know, Florida has long had vote by mail, um, along with early voting. Um, and both sides of the aisle have taken great advantage of voting by mail. It happens to be an excellent, excellent way to take your time, read through everything, mull things over, especially when we have, you know, ballot issues on the, uh, on the agendas. And in addition, the new supervisor of election, Wendy Lynn, think has gone to the county commission and gotten approval um, for pre prepaid postage. So now it is free. You don't have to worry about how much it is, putting the wrong postage on, making sure your kids from college, when they send it back, don't have the right postage, as we all know happens with our kids. They don't know from $1.27 or $1.17. So um, we are urging it. The Congresswoman has always urged it, and she is continuing to do so. If, if we see nothing else, we've seen during a pandemic, um, and certainly during these times, in a state that is uh, a hurricane state, there seems to be no better way to make sure that your vote gets counted. And Josh could um, also uh, give more information, but I believe in the HEROES Act that the House just passed was additional funding to ramp up uh, vote by mail. And just so you know, I mean, places like Oregon have been doing it for over 20 years. Um, everyone votes by mail. They get a postcard in the mail and they've been doing this forever. I mean, obviously they have for people who insist on going to, and we know there are always people who just prefer to go and have their cat. You know, I used to be one of those person, you know, I'm from New York. We could only go on the day you voted unless you were away and could prove it or sick. And I used to bring my kids and huddle into that little thing. Well now, especially with um, COVID, uh, best to be able to do it safely at home and not worry that if you wake up on election day, we are under a hurricane watch, God forbid. So, um, Josh, you want to add? Yeah, thanks, Felicia. I'll, I'll just add that if, if the congresswoman were still on the line, it, here's what she would say. She would say, yes, uh, there was a huge package in the HEROES Act to fund vote by mail. And more than that, uh, several times a week, she's on a, in a caucus call with her colleagues and vote by mail is brought up on every single one of those calls. So they are laser focused on this issue. And the suggestions that uh, vote by mail would create some sort of huge voter fraud issue is completely unfounded. Facts don't support it. And what we saw yesterday in Georgia isn't about voter fraud, it's about voter suppression. And uh, there's no question that the Congresswoman and her colleagues are focused on this issue. Hopefully the Senate takes up the HEROES Act or some version of the HEROES Act, and it will include uh, funding for vote by mail, but uh, she'll continue to stay focused on this issue. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of questions that came in via chat. Um, what can we do to help with the Florida unemployment um, disaster zone that it is? Uh, is there any, any petitions that need to? Do we need to write um, the governor, well, our local congresspeople? You as a chamber have a lot, especially in Delray Beach, where we know you are so vibrant and so important to the economy here in Palm Beach County. Um, I would urge you, anyone who has um, the ear of the governor or, or any of his key staff members, um, we understand that these are times that were unprecedented and that um, Places like DEO and, and websites were under a great deal of stress, uh, more so than anyone could have imagined. However, with that said, I can tell you that we are getting two to 
300 calls a day in our office. 90% of them are for unemployment, and a very high percent are those of people who have been trying to get unemployment since March and have still not received any money. And it's unacceptable. I mean, there are, there are stop gaps throughout this whole system that the Congresswoman and her colleagues have tried to make sure happened with pandemic unemployment, emergency pandemic unemployment. There are different ways, the $600. The money from the feds has been there, continues to be there, but has to go through the state site since the feds have no unemployment site. And so we would urge you to please ask the governor. We know that it's, it's tough times. There are a lot of people on this site 24 seven, but he could at the very least ensure that the monies go out. Maybe there should be a 24 um, seven ability to go on. The site closes at a certain time. It's not open 24 seven. Maybe that would de-stress the site. Um, there are people setting their alarms to get up at 3 a.m. to try to get on. Um, but people are becoming very desperate, as you can well imagine. And um, even going back to work, there's a lot of uncertainty, as you all know better than anyone. And so if you could reach out and urge him to do what he has to do, hire some of these unemployed people, uh, do what they have to do, and make sure not only people are getting on the site, but the money is going out. And I don't know, Brad or Josh, you wanna? Yeah, add? I'll just add one more short thing that the Congress brought up, which was that short time compensation program. Uh, we have been struggling to get information from the Department of Economic Opportunity in the governor's office uh, the use of that program. But what it does is it's a work share program that allows employers to continue keeping their employees on payroll, continue giving them benefits, but allow them to also access a prorated amount of state unemployment benefits. And in the CARES Act, the federal government uh, created funding to fully support that program. So at no cost to the state, they can upgrade their systems, get more people signed up for the short-time compensation program, and pay out those benefits. So there's no reason for the state of Florida not to utilize that opportunity. So um, what the congresswoman would ask is that the chamber reach out to get information about how your members can uh, enroll in this program and get information about how it's being used. Uh, and she'll be sending a letter to the governor uh, in the coming weeks about the issue of partial unemployment and the short-time compensation program more generally. That's excellent. I didn't know about it, so we'll definitely get on that. Thank you. Um, Shannon, Eden, I, you had a quick question about um, 501c3s, but I, I don't understand it. Do you want to just say quickly what the question is? I'll, oh, no, she can't. She's I'll, got no mic. <laughs> I'll take what I imagine her question okay. is. Um, under the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program, the, the PPP, uh, all 501c3s were and are eligible for that critical uh, uh, grant program or loan program, depending on how you use it. But um, obviously, you can get up to 250% of uh, your payroll that can be fully refundable and uh, it becomes a grant. What, what the HEROES Act did was it created uh, increased eligibility for all 501c organizations. So that would include the chambers, HOAs, and other uh, organizations. I imagine that's what she was asking about. The HEROES Act, again, passed the House, but we're hoping that the Senate will take action next. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, that's all the questions that I see. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ellen Smith of Waste Management. She's got a short presentation that she wants to give everyone. As you know, Waste Management is our sponsor for Chairman's Club. We couldn't do all the things that we do without them. So over to you, Ellen. Thank you. I'm about to share my screen. And as dry as a presentation on collection during a pandemic can be, there are prizes. Um, Opportunity to win some waste management swag here. So uh, we'll try to share the screen. Can you all see that? Got it. Yes, got it. Gotcha. Um, going very, 
very quickly. And on point of what everybody's been talking about is keeping employees on the job. We have focused a waste management on keeping our wheels turning to perform our 4 million service touches a year to the residents of Delray. And we're doing that by focusing on employee retention. I'm very proud that our national president has uh, guaranteed a minimum of 40 hours of pay for all our employees. We've made a commitment to no furloughs. We've invested in technology to have folks work from home. And I'm so proud that was a seamless transition, especially for customers. And we proactively connected with our commercial customers to guide them through downsizing during this pandemic. Um, and that will help them when the bill comes and said, oh, I should have stopped my garbage service. So how we're keeping the wheels turning is focusing on keeping our employees on the job. We have zero cases of COVID. We've lost no employees during this time. And we're very proud to say that. Um, overall, uh, collection during a pandemic, according to the Solid Waste Authority, shows about a 15% increase in garbage generated from your house. You're working at home and you're cooking and a 25% increase in the tonnage of recyclables. It's not the same in Delray as it is in the rest of the county. In the six weeks of mid-April through the end of May, this year over 2019, residential volume increased dramatically. We, in six weeks, saw 420 additional driver hours that we paid them for to make sure we could collect all the garbage that's being generated. And it was about 165 more tons, which is an 18% increase. And um, of course, we get paid by our contract and not the residential tonnage we collect. Um, and this is where I want to point out something specifically about Delray collection during a pandemic. Your recycling collection is down. Y'all are on the naughty list. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about that again, especially compared to the rest of the county where recycling collection is up 25%. Um, another point that's very important and was a challenge for us to keep our employees on the job faced with up to 45% drop in commercial volume in a matter of weeks. Um, as opposed to the residential collection we do, commercial collection we get paid by what we pick up. So that has been a dramatic impact on our, our bottom line. So pointing out the uh, lack, uh, not as robust recycling in Delray as other parts of the county right now. This is a slide that I um, <clears throat> is going to be uh, to win waste management swag right here. We need a caption for this slide. Now, clearly, cardboard is a very valuable commodity, and so is toilet paper. And guess what makes toilet paper right now with the lack of American paper mills? And so I'm encouraging you to come up with a caption for this sli slide that will encourage Delray to recycle, especially its paper, for a prize of waste management swag. You can email me if you have an idea. But I can't end in bathroom humor about toilet paper. So I will tell you that waste management is a global company that loves to brag that they have an impact locally, and because we do. Um, waste management of Florida uh, agreed uh, to support local restaurants we fed about 3,000 employees at 70 different locations in the state. And I'm proud to say Big Al Steaks um, fed 250 of our employees and their families this April. And we're proud to be a part of helping keep Delray afloat and to be your environmental service provider. Thank you for um, that little bit of time. And if you have any questions, I'm here. And that's the slide that needs the caption. Kristen Nofsinger, you need to come up with that. You're really good at that. I'm, I'm counting on you. Swag. We have a dozen <laughs> portable hand sanitizers. That's great. Well, hand sanitizers, that's like gold right now, isn't it? <laughs> well, I thought about a die cast truck, but I think these are more important. Yeah, I'm in. I'll help out. That's a new gold for us. That's a new gold. It's, it's unfortunate Delray's not meeting the recycling put out, set out rate as other communities. And that's surprising. You were down 10 tons last month. Yeah, I'm surprised about that too. We'll have to, we'll have to make our membership aware of that a little bit. I'm Cardboard. I wonder why too, Noreen, that's bizarre. Because salary people are usually pretty good about things like that. We're pretty responsible, so. Alan, do you have any theories as to why Delray is down on that? I do not. I imagine that y'all are ordering as much Amazon 
on as I am, <laughs> as the rest of the world, and cooking as much, so I don't know. Um, our statistics are pretty accurate, and our tonnage reports show that, and especially in contrast to an uptick of 25% in the rest of the county. Um, if we come up with anything more specific, Jim, I'll let you know. Jim, we need to like, reinvigorate No Plastics Del Rey and do like another town hall thing. Uh, I'm sure Ellen would be in on that. Jim, partner with Waste Management. Done. It's happening. <laughs> good. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you guys to that. I think that's a great idea, and we're you know getting good at the at the Zoom meetings and webinars. So I think that that could be a really good one, and it could be another a town hall type meeting. So Jim. We're going to talk to you about that. That'd be great. I think we need a tutorial, another one. Ellen, can you email those specific statistics about? Yeah, how yeah that'd be great. And then we can get on, you know, trying to change that. I think that would be definitely possible. We can band together. Especially cardboard. You know, there's no market for glass. There's not a lot of market for glass right now. And processing plastics is also challenging. So it's cardboard, cardboard, cardboard is the emphasis. Clean paper. Thank, Thank you for your time. Any other questions for Ellen? Anyone? Okay, well, I've just got a quick presentation um, just to give you guys an update on what's going on. So let's get to where we're at. You got it? So I just wanted to let everybody know, um, I've probably told you before, but um, the chambers participated with the city and the CRA and the DDA on um, the business task force, probably since day one, since mid-March, and we've met nearly every day since then. We identified about 30 business leaders and we held a, a several calls with the city manager and gave input. Um, and we aggregated the recommendations and sent them up to um, the city commission and they had several meetings to discuss some of the um, recommendations that we had made. This group also did walkthroughs on Atlantic Avenue when we started our initial opening of the 25%. We did a lot of calls and we did, um, especially to the restaurants and the merchants on Atlantic Avenue to see um, what the requirements were. And we did, we advocated on behalf of quite a few um, chamber members during the initial reopening phase, which weren't sure which, which things were allowed and what weren't and if, uh, if their bar wasn't allowed to open, can we get them some other type of license? So we did a lot of work with that in the initial stages and we continue with that. And we did present to city commission um, on May 9th and again last week on June 2nd. Um, for some of our recommendations. At the June 2nd meeting, um, we let them know that the, most of the restaurants and merchants did not want Atlantic Avenue closed for any period of time, but they really wanted the valets to reopen. And um, on Derry Morning Live this morning, Ryan Boylston talked a little bit about what the pilot plan is in place for, um, for the valets. They're going, they're going to cut it down to three valets that are gonna be on the side streets of Atlantic Avenue, and they'll, keep, they'll do like a, a right turn situation, so it won't have it won't impact the traffic. Um, and I think they, kept, they cut due valets out, so it'll help the traffic flowing a bit more. And we found that, and the restaurants um, had a lot to say about it. They felt that um, their customers would prefer to have valet. They felt safer than that. They felt safer with valet than they did parking in the garage and walking down the street. They just wanted to drop their car off, get out of it. The valets have a lot of safety and um, uh, cleanliness proto and sanitization protocols in place. So they would just get out right where they are, go to the restaurant where they want to and get back in their car and go again. So that's not helpful for the strolling around Atlantic Avenue thing, but it will keep the restaurants going at least while they're at 50%. Um, we're not sure about the phase two yet. I had a few questions about that today. The governor will decide um, when Palm Beach County can go into phase two, but the county commission did send a letter requesting that um, we're eligible, that Palm Beach be eligible for phase two. As far as I know, the uh, city won't put any additional parameters in place. We'll go with what the county's recommendations are from what I understand. So um, we're on Delray Morning Live this morning. We also talked about the virtual Delray Affair that's going to launch on Friday. It's June 12th through 20th. And it's, um, a, it's an online event that features our artists and vendors that would have normally been in the Delray Affair, but we I had to postpone it this year. We couldn't have it in April, obviously. So uh, we had a few zoom in, one from Atlanta and one local artist, and it was really excited to see them and they're excited about this program. And I also talked to a few, um, some of our members and uh, volunteers, and they're going to get together with their friends on FaceTime and do the, and shop the virtual Delray Fair together. I thought that was quite cute. Um, the education committee is working on 
breakfast. It'll be in September, probably the second week in September after Labor Day. So either the third <clears throat> of Labor Day or the next week. Um, it's going to be a virtual event and it's going to um, include some really interesting speakers as well as the comedian um, Sarge and some educational speakers. So we're excited about that and there are a lot of great ideas from that committee coming forth that we're going to incorporate into that event. The media breakfast or possibly lunch. We might do a hybrid Zoom conference with um, partial in-person meeting at Loft because they can house up to 300 people so we could have 100 there safely based on the guidelines, uh, CDC guidelines once we open up to the next phase. So that's going to come up in the near future so we're working on that. Leadership Delray is going to continue via Zoom for the next few meetings and towards the end of the year we'll be able to probably meet again and we're going to say that the leadership graduation for this year will probably take place at the legislative lunch. Um, and leadership 2021 is going to begin in January 2021. We're thinking of some really cool ideas for the Party in Paradise fundraiser. Um, and I've met actually with Sarah Martin. You guys may know her. She's really creative with events. So we had some ideas that we were talking about yesterday. So more to come on that. And the fall affair, um, tentatively scheduled, the dates we received from the city are October 17th and 18th. We're, not, we're gonna wait till mid-July or later to make a decision about moving that forward um, with the Special Events Task Force and the commission to get approval on that. We just need to wait a, you know, a month or so to see where we stand before we move forward with this. But based on the way things look, it's looking more positive. A lot of places like Pompano is doing their seafood festival in September. There are people doing in uh, St. Lucie County and Stewart are doing some events in July even. So we'll see how that goes, but I feel positive about that. Um, programming, as you know, is continued throughout all of this. We still do Delray Morning Live. Government Affairs has been doing great and getting a lot of traction online. We did Business and Bagels. All our committee meetings are taking place. All the leads groups meetings are great. They're getting to know each other even better because they're Zooming in each other's houses. So they're even tighter than normal. Same with our ambassadors uh, have been meeting and doing a fantastic job for us. Um, as is YPAD, they're doing a lot of fun things. Some of the fun YPAD things that they're work, doing and working on, we may take out to the general um, membership as well and do some of their fun programs. Like uh, we did um, trivia night um, following on what YPAD did, and we'll probably do a scavenger hunt night too. Um, exec and board have continued to be meeting constantly. Thank you, exec and board. And uh, the weekly webinars have been super popular and they'll continue for the foreseeable future. We've got um, items stacked up for the next month or two. I don't, um, we got some great traction and the staycation roundup from the Sun Sentinel. Um, we did a photo shoot safe, six, you know, six feet away with mask photo shoot at the courtyard pool, as you can see. And the campaign is gonna be keep locals afloat, kind of like we did last summer, but I think this is um, even more uh, critical. Thank you, Noreen, for going all in with heels, dress and pearls in the pool, God bless you. So we got some great traction on that Sun Sentinel article. They picked up on what um, sunny.org was doing, which is the Broward CVB and what the um, Palm Beach County CVB Discover the Palm Beaches did. But we were the only city that got a mention and got pictures in it and um, direct links. So I'm really excited about um, our participation. We're going to um, obviously keep um, promoting this. You need to go to your membership portal and you can be featured on the diarybeach.com backslash float. I'm going to try to get statewide PR for this, and I'm going to be submitting that to the Florida Chamber. They're looking for creative ideas that ch what chambers are doing Selling. for their businesses. So I'm going to be submitting this to the Florida Chamber, too. And last but not least, coming up, um, Real Estate Roundtable is tomorrow. Is that tomorrow? Yeah, it's tomorrow. How kind of you. Could and I can in about a half hour. I can hear you, somebody. Um, um, I'm zooming right now on the Delray Chamber. Oh, is that you, Ellen? <laughs> anyway, June 12th through 20th is Virtual Dairy Fair. The Tourism Roundtable is going to be June 16th at 10 a.m. Our Lunch and Learn is also June 16th. On 17th is Dairy Morning Live. And the 18th, I think we're going to change this to the 26th. We're thinking of a contactless cocktails where we do a wine rock around Pineapple Grove in groups of 10 or less. But that's probably um, going to be next week. And I think we're going to be doing government affairs on the Friday after July 4th instead of on the 3rd. So our next chairman's club was scheduled is July 8th for craft food tour for 12. So RSVP to me if you're ready to do that and uh, we'll try to get some of us together in person. And that's all I've got for everybody. Does anybody have any questions? 
that all looks amazing. I'm so proud of our chamber for doing such amazing things during this time. So thank you, Stephanie, and everybody, whole team. You guys are all unbelievable. Thank you, Kristen. Well, you're helping us with half the ideas for programming anyway, so <laughs> thank you. Anything else? Stephanie, if I could just remind everyone, um, first of all, thank you all for what you're doing. We love seeing things get more and more open and out there and just as long as everyone's safe. And if there's anything that any of you need that you think we can assist with, please call our office. We are fully manned. Um, everyone is working remotely, but we are um, fully set up in our homes since we are a hurricane state. We've always been set up that way. So um, we get our messages from the phones right to our cell phones and we have printers and full access to anything. So 561-998-9045 and uh, we're here to help. Nine nine eight nine zero four five. Okay, we're going to do that. Yeah. So I want to thank very much. Thank Representative Frankel as well as Felicia, um, Josh, and Bradley. Thank you so much for coming today and answering our questions. I know you're totally available to us, and I'm glad our chairman's club members and board members know that as well. So we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.